So kind of like dreaming and inclusive dreaming or collective dreaming or intersectional dreaming or the practice of dreaming from somebody else's point of view. How could I dream from your perspective, understanding that it is not possible? But if we're dreaming and it's speculative anyway, what if I dream of dreaming from your perspective? What would that future look like? Understanding that you are different from me and your needs are different from mine. And then what would that future look like where your needs and my needs and somebody else's needs could be kind of acknowledged? Welcome to the Pleasurable Ecologies Formations of Care podcast, presented by yours truly, artist, writer and pleasure activist Amma Josephine Budge, as part of my curatorial research fellowship with Ava International and Frame Contemporary Art, Finland. Join us over the next six months for a series of intimate conversations with artists and activists across Ireland, Finland and the UK exploring themes of pleasure, care and rest at the intersections of art, activism and ecology within these trans-oceanic localities. Each episode works to become, in and of itself, a potential site for recuperation, reflection and healing. So wherever you are in the world or ocean, I invite you to place your feet wheels or crutches on the ground and take a deep deep breath as we dive in i'm amma josephine budge and i use she her pronouns and i am a thick light-skinned black woman with uh, a large curly afro that is curled over to my right side, the right side of my face. I have red lipstick on and tortoiseshell cat eye glasses uh, and some rather fabulous black and iridescent glittery nails. I am wearing a light kind of dusky pink and white dress Um, with a round rounded neck and I'm sitting in a room which is my office and behind me you can see a a large uh, dress bag which actually has my wedding dress in it (laughs) there's a large dress bag there it's the only place in the house where it fits Um, and behind me there's a, a, a white wall that has some artwork on it and there is a hanging light bulb um above me yes And if you were close up, you could see I have quite a lot of freckles and dark brown eyes and some rose gold earrings on. Hello, everybody. I'm Sonia Lindfors. I use the pronouns she and her. I am a black Cameroonian Finnish woman, quite light skinned. Uh, I have a curly afro, which I hope would be a little bit longer, (laughs) not growing it. And now it is pinned up. Uh, and then I'm wearing a black shirt uh, and uh, a gray t-shirt underneath. And you can just tiny bit see the color peeking underneath. Uh, and then I'm also wearing uh, ear pods. And then I am sitting uh, on my sofa at my home, but you can't actually actually see the sofa because I'm using this funny Zoom uh, <laughs> Zoom background that kind of doesn't recognize my hair <laughs> at some moment. So my hair kind of disappears and appears from this, this background of melting colors of uh, kind of like purple, pink, light green-ish. Yeah, maybe that's it. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is He Norman Niemi. My pronouns are they and them. Uh, I'm a a white-skinned person with uh, dark uh, brown hair, uh, cut short. Uh, I'm wearing a print shirt and I'm sitting in a room um, with white walls, uh, small artwork um, in the back wall, and then a house plant hanging behind my head. Um, I have a round face, um, blushed cheeks, and quite thick, dark eyebrows. And yes, that's about it. 
So I'm joined uh, for this initial conversation by two absolutely incredible cultural producers uh, who are based in Helsinki, who I'm, I'm just really, really honored to, to be in conversation with you both. I've kind of been following your work, I've heard about your work and didn't know that you both worked together. I kind of also um, became aware of you both separately. So I'm, I'm really excited to be sharing space with you. So the purpose of this podcast is to think with uh, both of you and a kind of range of cultural producers, artists and social organizers based uh, across Ireland, the UK and Finland through themes of pleasure, care and rest at the intersections of art and ecology. And I'm really trying to see these geographical locations as specific contexts, but also transoceanic contexts in that they are made up of people's histories, um, arts, environments, ecologies that are coming from all over the world. That are kind of consistently um, potent and in flux and informed and are not kind of fixed or stagnant or rigid. So my research for this fellowship is an exploration of decolonial and intersectional curatorial care practices. And it's really important for me to begin this work exploring the incredible things that are already happening in these locations. I, I definitely am coming, I'm aware that I'm coming into a rich and also fraught context where there's been a lot of work, a lot of labor, um, a lot of pain, a lot of trauma and a lot of care that's happening and, and to honor the complex interweavings of history, politics and potential posited by each site. So as I mentioned to you earlier, I want this to be a relaxed dreaming and sharing session in which we might discuss care, pleasure, rest, localities, geographies, dreaming and science fiction and how they're all bound up with ecologies areas I know you're both invested in and thinking and living both separately and together in. So um, with that kind of general in introduction, I'm just going to pass straight over to you, Sonia, and it would be wonderful if you could kind of tell us a bit about your creative practice um, and maybe also the ways in which you have worked with Key in the past and are still working together. Um, yes, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting us. This is really exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking like, yeah, how, how important it is to have these spaces, these moments, these pockets to really think about these things because we do work with them, but then really kind of like uh, take a moment and reflect like what and why and how and how things are also shifting because they are constantly shifting. So I really do appreciate the invitation as well. So my name is Sonja Lindfors. I am a choreographer, uh, also an artistic director in a tiny counter-hegemonic anti-racist feminist organization called Urbanapap based here in Helsinki. Uh, but I also work with facilitation, education, uh, curation, uh, plenty of different things. Sometimes I joke that I work with life and art. So also it's it's... I think it's complicated sometimes to think about what is an artistic practice or a creative practice when they are also like practices or tools for survival. So kind of being in this intersection of art and activism as well. So I'm Cameroonian Finnish. Uh, and then maybe to some of the listeners, I don't know who are, where are the listeners based, but really just to kind of get some understanding of the Finnish context, like Finland is very like a tiny country 5.5 million people uh it's very white very homogenic still uh so so kind of trying to navigate through this question uh, with these questions of uh decoloniality or uh, equality equity dreaming speculative practices here in in a homogenic uh homogenic not only country but also a very homogenic art field is sometimes tricky uh, and that's also, I think, how our initially our our kind of paths have crossed. I think maybe you can key key uh, tell about this yourself. But you have been interested in similar topics, equity, uh, ecological, or 
uh, uh, sustainable practices, both kind of like ecologically sustainable, but also socially sustainable practices. We've been talking about this a lot. And then we've also been collaborating in, in Stop Hatred Now, which is kind of a, it's a, it's a platform. It's more, more of a discursive platform where different art institutions and art organizations that work with issues around equity and diversity come together to kind of facilitate a week of workshops and panel discussions and, and so on. So we have been more recently working around that. But of course, I've known Key for years uh, since, since the since the Finnish art scene is quite tiny. So then oftentimes we kind of like have cross paths in, uh, in some places I've seen some things that you have been curating or facilitating and so on. And then we've had lovely conversations. So hi, um, Guy Nurmanyemi here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's so lovely to spend this moment together. Um, what to say? I'm also working at the intersections of um, knowledges, practices, um, navigating the <laughs> homogenous um, art scene as a non-binary um, curator and um, combining um, combining uh, different aspects of sustainability, yes, but also looking sustainability quite critically and um, so for many, many years, I was work mainly focusing on like curatorial practice, um, but my practice was all, always like embedded in um, kind of like micro organizations, um, collectives, uh, residencies, very much centering on processes instead of um, um, curating exhibitions, for instance. And um, I also write about art or perhaps not about art, but with artists. And the most recent um, recent thing, very relevant to this conversation today is this um, art and research platform called UNOS, which I co-founded um, in the spring 2020 together with Anna Gajzakowski, a fellow curator and activist. So those are just a few things that I've been um, busy with lately. Um, and what else to say? Yeah, like I have this, as, as I mentioned, I've been working at these intersections of different knowledges and practices. So I have a kind of a weird background uh, or approach to curation or curatorial practice. So I was trained in sociology and gender studies and um, most of the curators uh, around here, they perhaps, they are educated at the art history department at the University of Helsinki. Um, so, so already there, like there is some, like a little bit of friction comes from, from having that background or approach to curating. Um, but yeah, it's really kind of, um, kind of a hybrid, hybrid practice and um, most recent thing also is this kind of a um, adventure in, uh, in the academia. So this year I also started this doctoral um, um, project or research project um, around, <laughs> it's going to be a long journey, I know, um, but it deals with sustainability sciences, but as mentioned uh, from a critical perspective, and I'm trying to look at how different um, art micro organizations, or in this case, residencies might help in rooting new type of practices or more sustainable practices. And yeah, like that kind of, uh, that interests me at the moment, like how to, um, how to kind of take all these amazing ideas that we have been working on for quite a while and we've been discussing and dreaming uh, how to how to root those or how to perhaps not scale or I don't know if they are scalable maybe we are going to talk about that as well um, but to kind of uh, allow them to circulate and and to reach people in wider context as well 
I'm rambling, I'm very excited, and I haven't been speaking a lot of English lately, so please excuse me. <laughs> and Sonia, it's so good to be with you here today. Uh, I want to emphasize how amazing platform the Stop Hatred Now Festival is. I've been honored to be part of this um, initiative for the past two editions, and hopefully I can continue towards the next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ki. Um, yeah, I really just kind of want to honor all the things that you've each shared, um, the ways that you you overlap and, and intersect and support one another and um, and also the kind of ways in which I think this work can feel very lonely, even whilst being in community. Um, together can you hear that loud noise in the background no great okay awesome <laughs> I'm like living with a deep frustration with all my neighbors at the moment <laughs> um so yeah and I think the other reason why I've really rooted this whole uh um fellowship process in conversations and actually my my own PhD has become largely conversation driven is because I want to kind of honor the, the way that we we pick up and pass the thread in this work you know we we sew our stitches and we pass the yarn and then somebody else needs it and then our needles break and we patch them together and we kind of do this work collectively and often we do it kind of behind the scenes right we do it um over dinner or we do it because we happen to bump into each other on the train or we do it because we end up on a panel together or we do it because somebody tells somebody about somebody else and I'm in London for a weekend and do you have time to like hang out or whatever and they don't always happen in these institutionally supported spaces often they happen in these kind of soft um I think I can't remember who calls them soft economies but these kind of soft economies of 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 emotional labor and and, and political that support political labor and creative work um so from there I'd love to kind of talk a bit and, and we can speak together. It doesn't have to be kind of one than the other. So to talk a bit about your relationships with care, uh, rest and recuperation as political practices um, or creative political practices or political creative practices. And I'm gonna challenge you both, not just to speak about these things in terms of your work, because you obviously both hold space for others to think about care, rest and recuperation, but actually also how in your own daily practices, you relate to, um, you relate to these kind of concepts and intentions. And I'm making that distinction because as somebody who identifies as a pleasure activist, who does a lot of work around pleasure as, as, as black healing um, and thinking about kind of rest and integration and reflection, as opposed to being reactionary all the time, uh, I am constantly working and and very rarely <laughs> stopping and resting and integrating. So I'm I live my own kind of hypocrisy, I think, and I'm I'm trying to be more honest about that actually publicly and transparent about that. So it'd be lovely to hear as much as you want to share, no pressure, um, both about your kind of general relationships to these ideas, but also in your personal lives. Do they, yeah, do they manifest? Are they possible um, in your lives or are they impossible dreams that you work to manifest professionally or both? <laughs> Sonia's like, <"Ki? laughs> I think you should take this one first. <laughs> okay, why not? Thanks, Sonia. So um, yeah, this is, a, <laughs> this is a nice one because um, this, this year so far, it's been all about like this uh, contradiction somehow. Um, I'll give an example. So PUNOS, um, this was supposed to be a platform for slow and sensitive um, curation and commissioning and um, very sort of carefully held spaces to tackle those kind of, uh, those aspects of the sustainability or ecological crisis that are perhaps not um, in 
sort of the limelight or center of the discussion, at least not in here in the Nordic countries or in Finland. So, um, so it was supposed to be all about like taking time and taking care of each other. And all of a sudden, like in March or April, I realized that I'm still pushing um, like I used to, uh, like pre-pandemic. So it's, it's like something within me had not changed, even though so many things in the environment um, had changed uh, or transformed. And I, I've been wondering and I've been having discussions with my working group, like what's going on? So why is there such a big gap between what we practice and what we preach? And I'm very lucky in the sense that I have a very amazing working partner, Anna Kaisakoski, who is constantly taking care that things that we are kind of, we become better recognizing um, the limits of our capacity and for me like having sort of preached so many years about like being porous um you know like like by accident sort of reinforcing this sort of like endlessly flexible curatorial practice and endlessly adaptive um now it's something else it needs to become something else but i'm not quite there yet so i'm not very good at taking care of myself and when I'm citing this wonderful um, residency director from Narva Art Residency in Estonia and Miriam Weikla so she told me recently that like when you're not taking care of yourself you really cannot like hold space and like take care of your residents so she was specifically talking about her residency organization but I could recognize this problematics very well. So a very long answer, uh, working on it, taking time, learning how to rest and to dream and not to worry all the time. And it's all about this amazing people around me and their ways of working, sort of teaching me to take it slower, calmer, easier. Yeah. How about you, Sonia? Hmm. So many things that you said kind of resonate with me, but I'm I'm kind of thinking that that it's the yeah you said it earlier. I think I often repeat this that I'm I'm working also with like frictions and fictions. So kind of like this world right now, like the frequency between like the constant urgency like in the different conflicts, the eco-crisis, like all, all of this. And then like this dream of trying to work slow, like it just doesn't, it just doesn't match. So even though when I'm thinking about it, like, oh, I, I really would just need to take this day off and take a walk and then something always comes. And when you come, like uh, when you're, I'm talking about this reactionary thing, like we're, we're going to get it later to this as well, but the, the project uh, or the platform or the framework that, uh, we're working with, with my friend and colleague, Marian Abdul Karim, which Amma is also a part of called uh, We Should All Be Dreaming, really kind of like came from this need, this like our own urgency to find spaces where we're not only reacting to uh, reacting to the existence, existing urgencies and the oppressions and like the different curveballs that our realities are like throwing uh, uh, throwing towards us, but also trying to find this space where we can also dream beyond, dream beyond mere existence. It's not uh, just about survival, not, not to only dream of, hey, wow, I, I wish I had uh, like a, a routine, a daily routine where I would feel soft and rest, not merely that, but then what, it, what would come after that? How would I make work? How would I think? How would, how would I connect with fellow uh, people and other living things if I would have that space and that rest and my body would be rested and my nervous system would be rested? Like, how would I operate? Would I have more tolerance towards diff different difference, like dif differences so like, yeah, so, so it's really interesting. And I think maybe I am 
or I feel I'm very lucky and privileged in the sense that I work like I'm a choreographer. So I also, when I'm in a rehearsal pro process, like I also get, like I have this, these moments kind of like these bubbles where we get to really spend time with our bodies and each other's bodies. So really kind of like breathing and going into body practices and, and moving and, uh, and just lying on the floor and dancing and sweating. So, so that's, and also like, sometimes it saddens me like this, the precarity of being also a freelancer and then this project-based economy that you have to all the time, like keep producing. So again, like the discrepancy there, trying to work slower, but if you want to work as a freelancer, curator, artist, uh, performance maker or whatever you need like in order to get funding you need to constantly be in this uh, production mode like hey let me do it, something new something new something new something new and at the same time like admitting to myself that actually I'm working with the same topics all the time I'm interested in spiraling spiraling with the same topics of coexistence or speculative futurities or dreaming or this is what I work with so but then to the funders we were kind of like playing this game where I have to pretend that I'm doing something new and I have to like frame it as new when, when it is actually the same thing but yeah it is so like these frictions and these discrepancies are so I, I think I don't I don't know this time right now like being in the mid of the pandemic and like Key, you said, trying to at the same time, like perform as we weren't or we're not kind of like accepting that, oh, actually this is our second year in and we're really like, everybody's tired, everybody's exhausted, we need to slow down. And then what we would actually need is this, uh, what's this, uh, Gansal Eisbach got this, or this, what's that in English? Key, this Perustulo. So basic income. Basic income. That's what I'm saying. I had to look for the word. We need basic income. So so kind of like we cannot let go of, of this const, constant kind of work, 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 create, create, create like this pressure without having some kind of like certainty. So it is, it is a vicious cycle in so many, so many ways. Universal income says Amma as well so oh, it is sorry. tricky <laughs> no maybe it's that as well but then another thing that you also mentioned like kind of like about holding space and like so I work as an artistic director I curate I teach a lot so I have also a lot of power I have power and privilege so then this question again like like because I think I'm a caretaker I'm also like the oldest I have uh I have four siblings, so I'm the oldest of my family. I really am a caretaker. I'm the big sister and so on. So, so really thinking about these questions of power, uh, responsibility, uh, then care. And, and if I'm not working in kind of, or if I'm working in hierarchical structures, can I, can I kind of lean to somebody who is, for example, working for me? Like how, do, like, so these questions are really complicated, really, really complicated. And of course it becomes even more messy because we oftentimes like in the art field, we work with our colleagues, our friends, that's my partner, that's my partner's friend. So it's so messy. It's so messy. And then if I'm the one kind of like facilitating or curating and I'm holding power, I'm making decisions. I'm, I've tried to be really clear about this. That I'm like that. Okay. Now in this situation, I have power. So I have the responsibility. So people then who are invited to the space by me are like, they, they don't have responsibility over me. So they don't have to take care of me, but yeah. So it, but that's really tricky. So uh, for like now Urbanapa is also facilitating a platform for feminist leadership so this has been one of the questions that has been coming up again and again and again that people like we're trying to push towards more feminist leadership like diversity in leading positions but then like people of color or like people from 
whichever kind of like marginalized group then really get exhausted in those positions because they really know and understand what power is and how a power operates and the responsibility that comes with that. And then at the same time, we don't have this support structure that would be needed in order for then us to kind of like have those spaces to rest and so on. So it is, it's like the world is so complicated right now. And then trying to navigate in all of this, I think I would just need need like a year of sleeping like in the Caribbean. I was just like telling my like my brother, like I just need to go somewhere, like lie, lie, lie on a beach and under coconut trees and have a drink and swim and you know read for a year. And then maybe I, I can I can formulate some thoughts that could yeah i don't know oh i felt like i mean you could just my head is aching from nodding so vigorously all through what you were just saying both of you oh i mean yeah i really 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 resonate and and i'm i'm just so also like grateful for how clearly you articulated sonia this messiness because it's something I've been talking about with friends and colleagues and writing about. I actually just wrote a piece for um, Frames, Rehearsing Hospitality's publication on this politics of invitation um, as, a, as particularly with, with, with women of color and, and people of color artists, inviting artists into institutional spaces, um, no matter how kind of like progressive those institutions purport to be, and, and the kind of politics of that and, and that it's like impossible to, to invite people into a space that is safe or that is not extractive and exhausting. But then what do we do? Do we just not invite people? And how do we not be paternalistic and kind of, you know, then make decisions for people? Because, you know, and these really the piece is a series of concerns and anxieties. <laughs> and I appreciated Key saying, I'm trying not to worry so much because you know, I, I have anxiety. I'm, I'm anyway, you know, I'm, I'm a science fiction writer. So my mind is like a million possibilities exploding all at the same time. So I'm always concerned <laughs> and worrying and worrying about uh, re-traumatizing and what, you know, those, those that I care about both, both personally and professionally. And, and I think, you know, and it is messy, you know, we are working with friends and partners and loved ones and chosen family sometimes actual family or not act as in biological family um and we're also kind of creating these sub economies that are then subsidizing capitalism because we work with and for each other you know for free or for less money than we would ask the institution for normally or we do more work because we care more about this person or this cause and, and, and these institutions are able to kind of thrive off of this wonderful diversity programming that we're creating together because we have these beautiful rehearsals where we just like hanging out with people that we love and we're having radical conversations and we're having dinner and we're like, we're going to make this piece. It's going to be great. It's going to be healing. And then you put the piece in a space and an all white audience comes and suddenly you're like, shit, are like, beautiful dreams are just being bled out kind of on this public colonial stage how did this happen we know better how did this happen and then who do we kind of turn to as as the for accountability and responsibility but ourselves and each other right and the institution but it's the same conversation with the institution so i think you know that messiness um and 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 kind of consistent failings I think with really quite high consequences I think these these ways that we are uh, compromised and compromise ourselves have quite high consequences you know some people retreat from the art world altogether people get their hearts broken by shows performances collaborations commissions um and 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 and, and it really is a kind of full-bodied heartbreak that then takes a lot of time to recover from and we don't have weeks or months to spend watching Netflix and eating ice cream to recover and society also doesn't understand because it's not a romantic heartbreak so there is no kind of um 
you know, emotional leave that you can ask. And there's no institution to pay you anyway <laughs> for emotional leave. So I think these kinds of messinesses and, and, and aftercare practices are really important to talk about and name and um, and, and share, uh, I think, tools, protocols, um, systems, guides, uh, uh, kind of like roadmaps for ways in which we are attempting, failing, building, patching up you know, together. And that's also why I'm, I'm just so excited to be having this conversation, because I think I have felt very disconnected from a kind of European conversation, particularly, I would say, a Black, critical, queer, feminist, European conversation. And that's not to say that, that it's not happening. But I think the kind of focus between the US and the UK, or the US and it's like, trickle down effects within like black feminist work can feel very isolating um and and so part of this this fellowship is also to kind of gather up these care documents key did you want to say something come in if you want to say something please interrupt me <laughs> i want to um respond to sonia about this sense of urgency yes yeah it feels it also feels ridiculous to demand slowness and to de- to demand time to incubate things if you will like over over long periods of time so it, this always comes up uh, in conversations uh with punos but in in other um other contexts as well like how do how how do we allow this sort of repetition needed uh in order to build a practice um but then again respond um to urgencies and not only react, but to be able to kind of uh, um, build um, build our practices collectively, proactively. So, so there is a big contradiction there, like how to how to combine these different different time frames, webs of time, <laughs> and then this kind of um, recognizing last year, this year more than ever, how it's extremely difficult to not to have an extractive curatorial practice and there is a, another contradiction there that um that then i'm just speaking um from my own experience like then kind of like there becomes this sort of carefulness in a way and like not knowing uh, what to do next when you realize that okay within this paradigm this is always going to be extractive one way or another so so previously we've been talking about tools and sort of like um building different tools into our project schemes in a way like resourcing rest um like just kind of like i don't know this sounds silly but building new budget categories you were mentioning like lying in the sun (laughs) in the in the i don't know where where but but kind of like um i don't know budgeting rest or i don't know if that's the right term just something that came to my mind how privileged it is to be able to be slow and who gets to be slow so for example i'm working with marian like uh marian has like two kids so again like being single parent of two kids is a very different kind of situation than i do and then we're, when we're talking about, for example, uh, contemporary choreography, like there has been some discussion, not much, but some discussion also about the aesthetics of slowness and softness and how oftentimes white bodies, uh, white performers have the possibility to kind of like also be in this practice of slowness. And like I've seen several works uh, by colleagues wonderful uh, touching works great works that can stay somehow in these questions of slowness and softness and so on whereas still very much at least in the performing arts scene what is expected of, expected of bl- black bodies is kind of like this uh this certain kind of like energy this uh, like this muscle tone like th- that comes back to the urgency and the working body and like the percussiveness and so on. So there's a lot of things that are not, are like that actually go deeper, deeper into our understanding of 
aesthetics of contemporaneity who can enter that what kind of uh, what bodies carry what kind of meanings and who can exist in what kind of space and so on and then yeah so it is it is really 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 complicated and really really there's so many entanglements there but at the same time I'm thinking that the one thing that for example we are doing by by trying to kind of repeatedly bring up this the need of slowness the need of time the need to budget time for rest and so on is to try to kind of like change the narrative because I felt that for like if I go 10 years back that I really felt that that was something that many colleagues and friends would pride about like hey that I'm so busy like I'm doing this that that that, 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 that that would really be something that you would just try to like casually bring up in conversations like how how many bookings and gigs and projects you were doing at the same time so so at, even though the world is not changing at the same same pace that our our thoughts are maybe changing that if we if we start to change the way we talk about things uh maybe that will start to change the way we think maybe that will little by little start to change the way we work and if we have energy then we can start to demand for like this hey let's let's budget this or let's change the schedule or so on but it's like it is really slow and yeah i just I just really want to point out again, like the unevenness and the inequality that is kind of always there, like when we're thinking intersectionally, that I am really privileged. I I have a working grant. Uh, I have a lot of possibilities. So maybe I can have a little bit more space for rest and slowness than many of my colleagues that don't have the same possibilities that I do. Um, I really, I really hear that. And I think that point around, especially the aesthetics of slowness and softness and who gets to, um, who gets to, who gets to do that, who gets to inhabit those aesthetics, who gets to have that time to, to think, have those kind of contemplations and also who, you know, even if we think about kind of publicness and presences in public, which communities um, and demographics get to wander kind of um, the street and observe and be listless um, and which communities are seen as um, occupying space or seen as um, congregating um, and therefore need to be policed um, and institutionalized. I think this thing around time and slowness and privilege is also really interesting. And I think as a Ghanaian, because my, my family are, are Ghanaian and, and English, and I, spent, I grew up between, between here and Accra, there's, I have a particular relationship with slowness because Ghanaians are famously slow. <laughs> I mean, you know, black people time, et cetera, et cetera. But Ghanaians are famously slow, even within the continent, particularly because we're, we're you know, we neighbor Nigeria and they are famously um I suppose not famously fast but famously active and there's a real like lethargy um in Ghana which which continues to just infuriate white settlers and expatriates (laughs) like I mean even myself it takes me about two weeks I think of being home to slow down enough to stop being annoyed all the time you know I'm like I just ordered a Fanta, you know, and the girl has gone to talk to somebody. She's dragging her feet. She's picking her nails. She's padding her weave. She gets the Fanta. Oh, where's the opener? She goes back to the bar. She chats to the bartender. Do you have the opener? Oh, it's at some table. Oh, I could open it with my teeth. 10 minutes later, the Fanta is no longer cold. Your food is no longer hot because you were waiting for the drink to come. And the kind of frustrations that come with exiting like the western time time scale it ta- you know there's a process of um decompression necessary before i think you can actually like exist and enjoy taking the time and personally i enjoy watching white expats being consistently infuriated 
And what's become really interesting, I think, as I've kind of learned more and read more around colonial histories and blackness, is thinking through how slowness um, is and was a form of resistance, particularly during colonial occupation. There's a, an amazing book um, called The Colonization of Time, I think, by Giordano Nani, where he talks about being late for the bus to the field um, in West Africa and, and people being late to the bus every day. And of course, the settlers saying, you know, well, these people are lazy. They have no concept of time. They have no concept. They're not efficient. They, you know, they, they are incapable of getting something done within a schedule. And actually that that slowness being a mode of resistance and, and sometimes the only mode of resistance that was possible, quote unquote, laziness was, you know, sometimes the only form of resistance that was possible. And I noticed in my own body when my, um, lack of productivity rises up as really a complete rejection of capital hyper productivity you know I mean I really have like a kind of I think of her as like my inner teenager who just sits there and says no I don't want to do it I don't want to do it now I don't want to do it later I don't want to do it and I'm not going to do it and I try to reason with her and <laughs> I have these long conversations where I'm like but we have a deadline people are waiting for this people that I care about are waiting for this and she's just like I'm done I can't be pushed any further today I'm done and I try to really respect that kind of capitalist like anarchist inside me that is like I absolutely refuse um so I think that I think that thing around like privilege and slowness is of course important and relevant and and lots of us particularly if you don't have dependents particularly if you're not caring for people on a day-to-day -day basis there are all kinds of privileges around flexibility of time that, that that we have but there are also ways in which I kind of want to reclaim slowness from a white privileged vocabulary that we also have histories of slowness and aesthetics of slowness and economies of slowness. Um, and, and that there is something, there is something uh, that I'm attempting to return to um, that is not about being, uh, not about kind of aspiring to or assimilating into a, a, a kind of neoliberal rest aesthetic of yoga and meditation and, 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 and appropriation essentially a kind of appropriated rest aesthetic um and actually this question around kind of budgets I love this having new budget categories and budgeting rest actually brings me on to my next question which is around the role of institutions and I, I'm sorry to say such a kind of boring safe statement what is the role of institutions but I really want to know I really want to know how much institutions are funding facilitating and supporting rest and care and dreaming time and I want to know what your demands are because I think this point that you brought up um in fact I think you both said it around kind of um the impossibility of not being compromised, right? These frictions and fictions being somehow inevitable, um, particularly when you're working with institutions because there's always an agenda and the funding comes from somewhere. Um, but, you know, what are your kind of demands? When, when are, there, are there times you've worked with institutions or you've had a project institutionally supported that you feel has worked? You know, you have appropriately... <laughs> is cracking up no there you've appropriately kind of claimed your reparations from the institution and gotten the things that gotten something out of it that felt like it was just for you and the people you were working to facilitate or do you always leave feeling robbed somehow some way despite the every attempt to close the loopholes of, of extraction it, no my answer is no like I, I do really feel if not robbed every time I do really feel that it is a struggle every single time and I'm really thinking again like is it just Finland that we're so tiny and like so again it's so homogenic and it's so kind of entangled 
and like here also power is so like be, like power operates behind like shadows so also like there's this weird kind of like fantasy of kind of finish fin, finish democracy and hey equity we don't need to think about these things because we're in finland and it's equitable and blah blah like yeah so there's there's a lot of things and then i oftentimes kind of like think that the institutions have forgotten why, why are they existing in the first place that they're there to like make space for something make space for something to happen for artists to make work or knowledge production or encounters or dreaming or like whatever it is but really that oftentimes like there has been a lot of like friction and i oftentimes think it's involved around the fear the fear of the kind of faculty of losing their position or their power or like not keeping up with the conversation like that they're like uneducated or they don't have enough information around questions of uh, like sustainability or ecological working methods or intersection intersectional feminist practices so then like this fear is so much present and um yeah but all, again trying to be clear that i think finland is also very specific so so sometimes when I've been working abroad, I felt maybe there's not that much money, but then there's maybe a little bit more freedom, whatever that is, that, that kind of like, or trust somehow. Whereas, whereas I feel that in our institutions, there's so many things that are, are just kind of not being said out loud. There's a lot of expectations. Uh, yeah, it is really tricky. It is really, really tricky. And also like, because I am who I am, I do end up all the time having fights and conversations and frictions where also that we actually, I think it's quite recent that there is a art management master's program in the University of Art Helsinki that most, I would actually say, this is really horrible, but I would actually say that most people that are working as uh, directors or like that have a lot of power in the institutions actually don't have any education for that work. Yeah, so it's really, yeah, it's a weird field. It is a weird field and it is a constant fight Again, I'm really privileged. I have graduated from the university, which is really exclusive, hard to get in, really white as well. Like I have, yeah, I have had a lot of success. So many doors open to me, even though I'm oftentimes like scary spice. Uh, <laughs> so, so going to the institutions to like make trouble, uh, feminist killjoy. But yeah, what do you think? Oh, I, I, I agree with everything Sonia just said. And yes, the, mm, the different art fields, they are slightly different mm, compared to each other. However, I think the situation within visual arts, it's even slightly worse than with performance and performative arts. So somebody mentioned like constantly failing there's there has been a lot of failing going on within Finnish art institutions and just responding to what Sonia said like um about feeling being robbed uh, I have to say that I've been working also on the other side and constantly failing there so I have to say that I had a lot of power and a lot of privileges working as um a curator with Helsinki International Artist Program, so one of the largest residency organizations in uh, Northern Europe, but kind of not noticing uh, how extremely white organization it is, and it was and is, and kind of like not doing enough to, to transform that. And, and that has also been kind of an important um, experience but it has taken some time to realize okay that residencies and micro organizations are not necessarily at all you know better than these these larger larger scale institutions 
And at the moment, where I am at the moment, my practice is totally incompatible with any art institution uh, operating here. So, so because there is so much, like, like from the outside, what I do with Anna is that it looks like non-productivity. It looks like these these people being totally lazy. But uh, but we're taking a lot of time to figure out like how to how to do things differently. And my worry is that while we are doing this work, it's so small scale that if we direct our attention to building this teeny tiny dream organization, so how can these practices and tools, how could they circulate? How could they, they be, I don't know, take root in, in the bigger institutions? I recognize that there is so much work to be done and it needs to be done collectively and not in a way that a few um, artists or people who are already burdened with the, with the crap <laughs> that the organizations are, are um, imposing upon them, that they have to do, do the work. Yeah, I just like, again, I agree with many things that Key is saying and also coming back to what you were Amma, saying about heartbreak. So I really, really op- like often have this feeling of disappointment and then this kind of like sadness, like this thorough sadness, because when I like, like dream, first dream of being an artist, I really thought that this would be the space where I could be who I was. I would have the space to be many things and grow and change and explore and it would, it would be joyous and it would be subversive and i really did and i still do believe in the power of art to change things uh, if i if i wouldn't i wouldn't do this but at the same time the lack of solidarity that i like for example post blm and all these conversations like that i really felt many of us like deepak artists were left so alone and then kind of like uh, the performative allyship and then nothing, and then nothing changes. And then kind of like the sadness and the frustration, like acknowledging that many of us really pushed ourselves to burnout. So all of these conversations, and the only thing that I'm kind of like thinking about is like, okay, how to, how to build also like our own institutions. And that's why we have Urbanapa, but it's so tiny and we have, really like we don't have any kind of secured funding so it's random every year what we can do and what we like can't do and so it's it's really tricky it's really tricky and then then kind of also acknowledging that that the things that give us joy that gives give us kind of life that gives give give us this feeling that that like we're coming together eating together going out dancing clubbing like going to events all these things that give us joy like makes like that that makes all of this worthwhile makes it like we're fighting for and now we don't have it anymore so I've been really thinking about also like in of course in our kind of like this black and brown community like that because now we don't come together anymore and I'm so worried about everybody's mental health people are so burnt out uh so like I'm just yeah like this heartbreak that you were talking about Amma like I really like that's really really like how I feel and I know many others are feeling that with me like the deep sadness and kind of disappointment and heartbreak and how do we move from here like how do we move on from here and how do we change things if we actually can change things and also because we've been uh, with Marian in this project that we have been working with this, we should all be dreaming. We interviewed a lot of like black activists that have been busy, for example, with decolonial work and anti-racist, anti-racist work for like decades, decades. And then kind of like understanding that this is a constant loop. And then sometimes you just feel that you can't win. You can't win. Like, you give it your all you like you use you lose your mental health your physical health like you use you lose your money you lose everything and then it just does not change and of course i also acknowledge that i'm 
I'm speaking from a position of really kind of deep frustration. And then there's a lot of things that are actually better that, for example, 20 years ago, like a lot better, but still like this, this deep frustration is really, yeah, how to escape that. And like, because now I don't have my normal coping methods. I would go out and dance, like dance for hours, like with my friends at a club and like let the, like just be lost in the music but I can't do that now or I would travel I would go somewhere like like Ghana and just like forget about it for a while but I can't do that now so I'm tra- I, re- I, f- I really feel that I'm trapped here and many of us feel trapped here in this reality and just like in this loop of fighting so like how to change things how yeah I mean I I really I feel you I wrote down as you were speaking you know this grief and I think also not having of course some people do but I don't for example have communities where we have rituals for grieving where we have you know seven days 12 days six weeks of mourning on on the first week you do this and the second week you do this you know don't have these structures where um (laughs) we can process what happened last year what's still happening um and the, the the fact that the kind of global epidemic of white supremacy just continues to take and like the victories are so minuscule <laughs> in comparison to the losses, not just historically, but now, like this week, today. And I, I think, you know, I have also been thinking a lot about kind of escape and uh, I felt very trapped in the UK for a long time, actually. I think you know something about being on a majority white island that is still so much the heart of empire, that is still so in love with its own image as the white saviour. And something about your particular, I think, also brand of racism, which is something that I, I think is also really true when I'm in the US, which is, of course, you know, plagued with so many of its own evils. There's something particular about that racism being one step culturally removed, because there's something very intimate about the racism you grow up with. Um, and, but also the idea that there is no escape. <laughs> I was thinking when you were talking about being on a Caribbean island, I fantasize about my own island, an island with only me on it. (laughs) Only me (laughs) and maybe a few people that I've invited. (laughs) And I say that because, you know, I I have a wonderful partner, a beautiful wife, um, and we do not travel, uh, we do not pass the strait in public spaces. And when we are in black spaces, um, in black countries, our existence becomes incredibly tenuous. Our safety becomes incredibly tenuous. So also I think, you know, (laughs) what happens when you can't, uh, you can't go and sit on a beach somewhere. And that's not to say there aren't places where black queer people go and escape. Of course there are, and there are of course those places, but I think, certain people of certain presentations um have far less spaces of escape even if you have the passport and the visa and the money right if you have been the good immigrant who has you know invested your life in capitalism and and to, and, and and capitalist white you know um betterment right you get the rewards of capitalism but you can't use them anyway because they were never meant to apply to us And I think this thing of burning ourselves out to the point of death, because that's the reality, is something I'm also really trying to to talk about, particularly with with friends and colleagues who I see uh, deteriorating, physically and emotionally deteriorating. 
you know, I'm 30 years old. I'm a baby in the in the in the in the grand scheme of what I hope will be a long life. And yet I'm in this position where I'm often the most experienced, supported um, black queer woman in the room. Sometimes, yeah, black queer woman artist in the room. And that is that is because, you know, you know, I'm mentoring, I'm mentoring people all the time. And I think that is because there are so few of us left. That is the reality. Present black queer women artists who are 50 and above. The ones that I know personally, I can count on one hand. And some of them have retreated from public art spaces but a lot of them just aren't here and that's the reality so I, I I really also want to think about okay how do we be here in 20 years and often more and more my answer to that is it means not talking to the institution it means not taking on that project it means not trying to scale this up how do I think about you know, again, coming back to not being reactionary and coming back to different kind of timelines and, and, and time scales. If my priority is being here in 20 years, as opposed to fixing everything or some one thing, one thing, <laughs> fixing one little iota of racism, suddenly everything become, feels very different. And the priorities are different, the choices are different. And I'm really trying to reorient myself not to stop doing the work, of course, but how do I do the work and be here in 20 years? Everything about how I move and exist in the world somehow shifts. Um, and it brings me back to the need for dreaming time, speculating time, um, fantasy, pleasure time. Because if I can't fantasize about something worth being here for, then I can't fight off every other system telling me that I won't be. So my kind of last, uh, I suppose, invitation is, I suppose, like, what are the kind of ways in which you're, you're dreaming or, or how does dreaming and the speculative keep you going hmm. yeah that's yeah it's it's that's just a such a big question but i really do think that dreaming is survival in so many levels and uh, kind of coming back to again as i said that i i've danced since i was four and then also like being a black kid in a very white context in 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 Finland in the 80s. So so kind of trying to navigate towards spaces where you could get the glimpse of freedom or kind of letting go and so on. So and I consider that kind of dreaming already. So again, thinking about like what do we think when we use the word dreaming? Like like is, is dreaming kind of having a cookout where people come and you see your friends and family and like that softness or is it going out to a party where your friend is DJing and the music is amazing and you just like lose track of time or like how do we acknowledge dreaming because I don't also want to kind of co-op this the dreaming is just something that that we maybe coming back to what you were saying about time and how it is so complicated this question of slowness and who gets to be slow and like slowness is present in many spaces but then the narratives for example around contemporaneity or whiteness or modernity and how like how the notion of of uh speed and progress and time are kind of entangled with those so this is again like really really like a complicated thing because dreaming has been so co-opted also by the capitalist society and then when i say dreaming some people start to think of like hey money like oh a new car or uh, like whatever it is so then the, this question of dreaming and desire and what is it that we desire and how is my 
desire kind of tainted and entangled with uh, the norms of the society and what is it that I'm dreaming of and what do I really really want to dream of am I dreaming of somebody else's dreams whose dreams am I dreaming anyway can I dream of things outside of language what if I don't have the words for these dreams that I have like how do I express them and then Uh, or how do I communicate about my dreams if they don't have, like, if I don't have language for them? And then, like, uh, a colleague and a friend, like, were probably of our, both of our, our hours, like, a performance artist, maker, thinker, Kit Koko, uh, here has been talking about kind of these uh, fragile structures that also, like, there's so many, we have all these things and networks and and relations that we don't have words for, that we don't have words for because of like the colonial language or the history of our thinking. And we don't have words for them, so we, then we don't recognize them or we cannot acknowledge them. And then can, we cannot talk about them in the same way. They cannot enter our academic realm because we don't have language for that. Uh, so, so dreaming, I think, is survival. But then again, how, how like, dreaming is also it's so transgressing and it's also fugitive it, it escapes all the time so it's also really hard to actually say like where the dreaming happens and how and why and then i'm just like in my own practice try to try to also use this uh horrible uh, like like the how how like the neoliberal art field is kind of like trying to suck everything into it it sucks your life it sucks your struggle everything becomes an art process so i've tried to kind of like use that the other way around so okay if my life is work then how do i make the work which is my life kind of about these things like how how can i center then care and and dreaming and then it's horrible sometimes like sometimes we play with this notion that like for example the project that we're working is it, it it with it's kind of a trojan horse so then like all these white institutions are hungry for diversity and oh like decoloniality like all these buzzwords and actually we just have, want to have time and like discuss and talk and dream with fellow feminists and uh fellow makers and fellow colleagues and that's what all we want So then kind of how to wrap, wrap it up as something that the white institutions want, but then actually do what we want. And, and again, like, and at the same time, I'm appalled that we have to do all this trickery, that can't we just fucking do what we need to do? And can't we just like live and exist and dream? But it's not possible yet. But, and I, I really, it's so, it's again, many things are kind of like, funny horrible funny horrible they're like both like funny and so horrible at the same time so i was like facilitating a workshop uh on futures with kind of uh in all the universities so in that course there was like there were architect students and engineers and so on and then I, like trying to like invite them to speculate with me Like, hey, what, like, from which perspective are we, for example, thinking about the future? Like, whose vision are we envisioning to the future? Whose futures? Who are you imagining in that future? Uh, since they are people that are actually creating structure, it's just structures into that were concrete, like buildings and like things and how, how things operate. And I was like, again, I was just like devastated that most of them had never thought about these things so kind of like dreaming and inclusive dreaming or collective dreaming or intersectional dreaming or the practice of dreaming from somebody else's point of view how could i dream from your perspective understanding that it is not possible but if we're dreaming and it's speculative anyway what if i dream of dreaming from your perspective What would that future look like? Understanding that you are different from me and your needs are different from mine. And then what would that future look like where your needs and my needs and somebody else's needs could be kind of acknowledged? Understanding that it, there will never be like a, like a pain-free, frustration-free, free, heartbreak-free utopia because, because all of our differences, but then this question of how to coexist 
and how little is enough and like what if our desires would be somewhere else not in money fame efficiency but in collective uh, in collectivity or joy like how to center joy like what about joy what about joy and how to like bring that maybe not in the center because maybe there's no longer one center but multiple centers but in those multiple centers there could be like joy and coming together and the question of care and also also grief and sorrow but i think joy and sorrow and joy and pain they're also like so close to each other so so dreaming is vital it's it's survival and i i think we all do it at some level like kids playing and you know these moments when you see like a parent and their child holding hands so it can be also in these tiny moments where something like kirkoko says something like that's like these fragile structures that we yeah we can't maybe just name but maybe the dream is there somehow yeah thank you both of you for your thoughts okay my thoughts are very messy today and i'm still processing a lot of what you what you two have been sharing um but i i can say that i've been very bad i suck at dreaming <laughs> and i've realized lately that i've been dreaming somebody else's dreams for the bigger part of my life um and this has to do with my uh, sexuality and gender identity um like coming out uh, relatively late in life and having this sort of talking about presentation um being like a well the terminology might be different also in finland as in the uk for instance but like female presenting non binary person so with kind of an individual like invisible identity so that creates different sort of struggles and um puts different type of pressure on on dreaming learning to dream my own dreams and um finding joy in queer dreams and queer ecologies um i'm thinking about so many things right now i'm thinking about when it comes to uh practices and circulating them and rooting them i want to uh, chime in with uh, with ama that yeah maybe not scale up maybe it's not possible maybe you know quit that dream <laughs> but uh but find other routes um chiming in with sonia finding the joy starting from there somehow i don't know how day by day i've been starting to write a diary and it's been a while and it's very confusing and kind of embarrassing as well but um but it's also very um addictive and kind of helps um did i already mention transformations not transitions and this is a very particular discourse so so i found sort of a pleasure and joy from this idea that um in like the sort of um sustainability debates there's often this idea that that uh, the society somehow transitions in a neat and uniform way to renewable energy sources for instance uh but i quite like this idea from this is one of the leading researchers from step center they have a different approach there and they emphasize the plurality and radical nature of transformations and kind of incommensurable oh my goodness what a word uh incompatible knowledges and different time scales or frames and somehow yeah in this particular kind of sustainability context um acknowledging the social ecological side i really like to start think of think about more of these transformations instead of like clear cut uniform transitions mm. No, totally. I love that notion of messy transitions. I'm thinking about also Donna Haraway's hot compost piles and and composting and and decompo decomposing is something that I'm I'm working on at the moment is 
the decomposings of of empire and and the rejections of that the re- re- reactions and responses um to that oh okay so in conclusion it's messy 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 <laughs> we need to i think you know be be somewhat more transparent perhaps about how messy it is because i think we also you know we can also like slap a filter on it and make it seem like it's all so beautiful and rosy and you know but we we persevere anyway and you know we we do and that's magnificent it's it's extraordinary that we are all here and it's messy and there are costs and there are casualties and they need to be mourned um yeah i think i think joyful mornings are also something that i'm moving towards um yeah okay beautiful so thank you thank you thank you i have so much deep gratitude um thank you so 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 much thank you this was really again a vital space and just yeah these moments of having this kind of really deep conversations have been rare too rare like during the pandemic so thank you very very much for this